Welcome into the Gig'em 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley, joined by Carter Carls and Coach Terry Bowden um, from ULM to look ahead to this weekend's game between Texas A&M and ULM. Coach, thank you so much for, for taking a few minutes to join us. Well, you're welcome. Uh, it's a... Uh... It's a great opportunity for my players to go to one of the great venues for college football. Uh, and also, they're paying us a lot of money, so I feel like we owe them a, owe them a little bit. <laughs> no doubt. Kind of a, a perk on both sides, right? Yes. Um, Got to ask you, so obviously, um, I'm sure you've, you've, you've gotten a lot of questions this week about Jimbo uh, Fisher and your relationship right. with him. What's it going to be like to coach against him? And do you do you still kind of look at him as a former player, or do you? Or is enough time passed now? That, Gosh, it's a, that, no, it's been it's been. A, now he'll always be a former player. He played for me at Salem College and at Sanford. Yeah. And you got to remember, he's from first, forty years ago. I became a head coach in nineteen eighty three. He was at Salem College. He was a senior in high school, and I recruited the heck out of him. He was a little bit short, so I thought maybe I could get him because he was the best athlete in the state. I thought. Uh, and but five eight or five, he'll probably say he's five ten. He's uh, probably five seven. No, no, I'm just kidding. Don't get, don't get. <laughs> but you know, but but he was just so short enough. I thought I might get him and recruit him very hard. Uh, sat in the basketball race stands with his mother, watching him play basketball. He played every, every sport: baseball, basketball, football. But the last minute, he goes to Clemson baseball. Just I, you know, I think probably a chance at that. But for, for whatever reasons, got homesick, came home in Jan in December. And, and okay, so I know I hear about it, and so I'm all over him. I'm all over him, and so I work him hard and talk him into coming to play for us. Salem was about 30 minutes from his home, and um, and I grew up in Morgantown, about 45 minutes away. You know, Rich Rodriguez, who coached with my brother and coached with me, was born right down the street from him, and Nick Saban right down the street from him. We all kind of grew up in that area. So Jimbo played, played for me two years at Salem, and we won the um, um, uh, conference and play for champ. Then I went to new, I went to Akron as quarterback coach. Then went to Sanford as a head coach, no scholarships all. And I talked him into transferring to play for me at Sanford this last year. I said, I'll, I can't give you any money, but I'll promise you I'll always hire you for a job if you want to coach. Cause I'd already recognized that he was very competitive, very, uh, love football. And, uh, he'd be, if he wanted to coach, he'd be a good coach. And so he played for me at Sanford division three. We won not, we went nine to one. He had a great year. And then he, he, he was with me 13 years till I finished up at Auburn and Damien Craig was our quarterback and I had Damien. And then in our last year together, full year, our last four year ago, 97, we came one point away from beating Peyton Manning in Tennessee in the SC championship 30 to 29 with Damien as a quarterback and Jimbo as my quarterback coach. And, and after that, I moved on um, and went to ABC for 10 years, but his brother, Brian played for me, a tough guy. Brian was, and, 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 uh, and Jimbo became like family. We traveled together uh, he, he went, he was always in the car with me on trips so we could talk football. So when I call plays, he wouldn't call his own. Jimbo has a, had a habit of liking to run the offense by himself if I didn't bother him too much. So anyway, we had a great relationship and we, and we always have, that's a long story, but we've, we've been close with our whole family ever since. That That's awesome. I, I, we just talked to him actually on the, uh, SEC tele teleconference and he was, uh, talking about how when you recruited him that everyone thought he was more of a defensive back. And I think it's because he's a little bit shorter, like you right. said, um, but you saw him as a quarterback and you liked him as a quarterback. And yeah, he obviously was, was really good at baseball too. But uh, uh, what did you see in him as a quarterback? And then what would you describe him like as a quarterback and just his personality in the locker room as a player, as a teammate? He's a, he's a fiery competitor. I, I think what you see is what you get. He was a fiery competitor as a quarterback. He'd fight you at the drop of a hat, hung around with linebackers and offensive linemen more than receivers and kids like that. Uh, tough, tough kid, uh, very confident, but biggest asset as a coach. Well, and very smart. His mom was a teacher that very smart, but I think his biggest asset was his, his – it, which I like in all my quarterbacks, and Damien was the same way. He was extremely competitive. He 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 didn't want to lose anything. I don't care if it's po poker or, or dominoes. He didn't want to ever lose anything, and so that's the most important ingredient I need for a quarterback. Besides, you know, decision making and accuracy and those type of uh, Brady type of things and Montana type of things. It's a, it's it's the competitor aspect of him that uh, that that I wanted as my quarterback and. Uh, he, he, he did a great job of, of, of that. 
So you mentioned when you brought him in as a as a coach, was was it some of those same sorts of qualities that you thought would make him mm-hmm. kind of a good coach and go on to do great things? Well, I mean, he was a, he he's smart and he loved football and he and he and he and he loved football and he and he and he got it. He understood it. Um, he was in the. I mean, I had my brother Tommy in my press box. I had Jimbo in my press box. I had Rick Trickett on my sideline. I had some good people out there coaching. And uh, but but Jimbo could see the field. He understood the game. Mm-hmm. And he had confidence. So when I'm on, when I'm calling plays on the sideline, I want somebody confident up in that box. My favorite story of Jimbo: We're playing Florida at, at Gainesville, and Spurrier had never lost a game in, in Gainesville. And we were we were riding a 15 or 16 game winning streak. We'd never lost in our in our entire time at Auburn, and we're 17 point underdogs. They're really good. I mean, that, that's 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 worthful days and all that. And uh, yeah. and so I got the first series, and I, and I and I and I call up to Tommy and Jimbo and said, "What looks good?" And Jimbo says everything. Now everything <laughs> never looks good. Everything never looks good. Some things look good, but never everything. He said everything, and I, and it, it, I almost laughed to myself. I said it, it gave you a sense. Hey, let's go get them. We, everything everything looks good, coach. And we went out and we we won 38-35, Scored on the last play of the game and had one of the biggest wins in Auburn history. Uh, yeah. And had to, uh, uh, and, and and improved our winning streak. But that's that was kind of why he was. Uh, you liked him. Uh, he just he had a great confidence in there about himself that everything looked it's the possibilities that everything looked good uh, but um but that's my that's my that's my definition of him and that's the way he'll treat a and m when people put his back to the wall he only has one answer he'll fight and so whether that you know that that that's what you get when you take a big job like that with the money like that but i know when when the, when the back goes against the wall he only knows one answer and that's fight and that's that's he's a competitor and you know he had the chance to to coach under Bobby Bowden, obviously yes. a, a legend. I, I, I just wonder what it was like for you to, to see him kind of grow up and yeah. then coach under Bobby. And then also, did you imagine that he would make it as far? Like, I mean, you, you knew yeah. he was going to be successful, but to, to win a national championship and to yeah. do what he's done, did you expect that? Well, let, let me take it further. When, I, when my dad was looking for a quarterback coach office coordinator, I was a broadcaster in New York City with John Saunders. I was doing ABC football. My dad lost his coordinator. He was looking for one. So they actually hired me at Florida State as a consultant just to pull names together for my dad. The season wasn't over. And so I pulled names together, and, and I could give you a list of four or five guys that are top head coaches now that were in, coordinators at that time that wanted to, to be considered for that job. My dad was getting older. And uh, I said, Dad, you know, Jimbo's been with us forever. He's been my quarterback. He, first of all, he'll coach your quarterbacks, which is what you need, really need that. But he'll also be your coordinator. But Jimbo had a good job at LSU. So as I was called, talking to Jimbo every night, I said, Jimbo, my dad's older. I said, if you do a great job there, I, you, I, his staff is older. you got a great chance to be the next head guy. And so I worked very hard uh, for my dad to get Jimbo to move from LSU to Florida State. And, 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 and my dad trusted my decision. So my dad hired him and it happened to, you know, although it was kind of, they kind of pushed my dad out. It wasn't, I don't think it was Jimbo that pushed him out. It was just people take over. You know, when you coach, my dad coached who was 81, all the people that hired him were dead, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everybody left that was running the show there and Jimbo, I think, but anyway, it worked out where um, he went down and, and, and took it over and won a championship. And uh, so he was part of my dad for four or five years, which was great. And then um, he um, went on to win a championship there. I went. I remember I drove down to, from from Orla- up from Orlando just to be at his first press press conference when he got the coordinator title, and um, and then from there, of course, he, he went out and won a championship. And uh, now he's if, you know you get, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it because he got the he got it he got into the what the toughest division in college football is the SEC West. I, I felt that way thirty years mm-hmm. ago, and I still feel that way now. When you look at his personality when he first started coaching and where it is now, what similarities and differences do you kind of see when when you look at him uh, where he is now? Still fiery, still competitive. And if y'all ever talk to him much, being a West Virginian, he loves storytelling. It's an old Appalachian thing. He can sit and tell stories, funny stories forever. Um, that's that's part of being from West Virginia. and and, and but But he is the same fiery, competitive guy I think in that while that short while he was with Nick, uh, mm-hmm. he saw the characteristics of Nick that were different than my dad. Although Nick, my dad recruited Nick in high school. I remember going to Nick Saban's high school football game with my dad. My dad recruited him out of Monongah. 
and I was next GA for a one semester at West Virginia. But I think he took on a lot of he he found the qualities of Nick, and 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 incorporated that too. Because as much as Jimbo loved my dad, and he truly loved him, he not like my dad totally. You know, he's Jimbo. Uh, yeah. just like I'm not like my dad totally. Uh, but I think he he uh, he also saw the qualities that Coach Saban had while he was with him, and made sure he he. Um, some days I see Coach Saban in him, and some days I, I see my dad or me. But most of the time, I just see Jimbo. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you too about just Jimbo this off season. It, it was a big talking point about him hiring uh, Bobby Petrino and, and giving uh -huh. up play calling and. I wanted to know, like, first, does, does he ever lean on you for advice with these sort of situations? And then secondly, uh, did you ever see something like that coming where he would give up play calling? And uh, did that surprise you a little bit? Uh, again, I can't speak for Jimbo, um, um, but everybody sees it coming somewhere along the line. I remember Spurrier, I think, gave up play calling twice and took it back twice. Uh, I, I gave it up in my last two or three years and, and, uh, and I've kind of gotten back involved, but I, you have to understand how to do that. I watched my dad, one of the great play callers of the eighties and seventies. Uh, and even to the nineties, give it up for Brad Scott and Mark Rick, uh, but know how to add two cents. Uh, Jimbo will never probably keep his nose out of it, but I, I don't think you can hire him personally. I don't, I don't know the, I, I don't want to get into that, but it's hard to hire a Petrino and not let Petrino coach. You know, I, I think that's yeah. one of those things. How do you hire a guy like that? With his background, and then and then and then step in. But my dad taught me how to add without taking away. Getting on the headset, and knowing when to talk and when not to talk. How to add to an offensive coordinator's thoughts without taking away. And I know when I had Jimbo and my brother Tommy and Rick Trickett on my staff, I could call plays and I could say, Jimbo, what do you like? Tommy, what do you like? Trickett, what do you like? And in the and in, in, in five seconds, call one of those three or call my own play and get four opinions, but I don't, that, that takes a little while to get that. But I think mostly he's, he's recognized that he's in the, they, they hired him to get a job done and whatever he has to do to get it done, he's going to get it done. I was going to ask you about uh, Tyrone Howell for you guys mm -hmm. and, and was reading about just his, how he took all the feedback from, from scouts and all that and, and opted to come back for another year with you guys. What's it meant to have kind of that veteran presence and, and what's he like to coach as a player? Well, he's be, he's very talented. Uh, he's our most talented receiver, uh, and uh, he caught I think nine passes the first game, four the second. Yes. But we we try to find a way to get him the ball. But people can double cover him and 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 take him out. You know, they can put the cornerback on him and a safety over top, and yeah, and force us to throw somewhere else, and that may open somebody else up. But he, it's not to have a guy like that uh, um, has been a real plus for us and uh we'll have to we'll we'll have to find ways to get him the ball throughout the season and um, mm -hmm. um but it's also nice for our other players too because if you if you can imagine at a group of five school you don't get a bunch of scouts coming through your practices every day and, and yeah. that that motivates your team it motivates your team so we get four or five every every week coming through at least so far in the season and that that your, your players always have a little more bounce in their step when they have a pro scout watching practice. No doubt. No doubt. For sure. And um, another thing I want to ask about your team, you guys have been really good running the football so far. I think y'all are top 10 in yeah. the country as far as rushing yards per game. Uh, what has been so effective for you guys so far? And do you expect that to be a strength as, as the year continues? Well, you know, we've broken in two quarterbacks that have started their first college game. So, mm -hmm. I, so I, so I'm trying to, trying to, bring along slowly. And so, uh, uh, and so they both, I expect them both to play. Uh, they both can run our offense. Uh, but if, you know, one got, um, it was not as sharp. I put the other one in, you know, and, uh, my dad used to tell me, cause my dad had cut, there were a couple of years we played two quarterbacks, not very often, but he played, he said, some days one guy just not throwing strikes. He's not hitting the edges of the plate. And you got to put in the relief pitcher. And I think that's what we felt like, uh, first game, both of them were, had not started. And so the backup came in and he hit a touchdown pass and we kind of said, okay, you sparked us. Let's let you go the next game. And so, but I've told them both, we can't get through the season without a couple of quarterbacks. And my, I'm always pulling for the senior who persevered and has put in the time and has paid its price. And, uh, but uh, the freshman six, four and a half, two twenty eight, and can throw it too. So we'll, 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 um, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let that play out throughout the year.
And you guys have done some nice things early in the season on the defensive side of the ball. Um, how encouraged have you been? Have you been about that? And what are maybe some things you've you've seen from your defense through the first couple of weeks? Well, Vic Coning is my defensive coordinator, mm-hmm. and uh, and I would have to say you wouldn't have you probably like Jimbo or like uh, other coaches or head coaches. I, I I I stick my nose in on the offensive side of the ball, mm-hmm. and you know which Spurrier would have done the same thing. Nick Saban, I'm sure he sticks his nose in on the other mm-hmm. side of the ball. Uh, yeah. And so, but Vic Coning was my brother's coordinator at Clemson. He's been in West Virginia, been Illinois, been been a coordinator for a long time. Uh, and he uh, knows what he's doing. And so he's been able to bring in some people that can run a little better and play his style of defense. Uh, but we did, we got pushed around a little bit against the second half against Lamar. We lost our motivation. We got ahead 21 to nothing and didn't play well in the second half. And, and so as well as we played defensively the first two games, the second half, we just didn't quite have that, that, uh, that energy. And uh, he's been on them pretty hard because uh, Texas A&M will push us all around. If we can't play our very be- hardest, I'll say hardest, if we can't play our hardest yeah. against at A&M, it's not likely you can slow him down. So he's got on there, but he's he knows what he's doing. And uh, uh, Vic Coning and the defense, just a little more athletic than we were last year. But, like, again, we're, we're, we're uh, comparing apples and oranges when we go from Army and Lamar to Texas A&M. And then last one for me is just uh, Miami game. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much you can take from the Mexico game, but – uh, what do you think of that a and team you saw? Do you think that's a team that will get better as the season goes on? And then um, any anything, yeah, just it's general observations about that game. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, watching the game, in which I have watched it, and I watched TV copy, and I saw a little bit of it live. First of all, Miami and Florida State are two teams in Florida that are pretty dang good. They, 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 they've had some of the best talent in America the last 30 years, and – both of them, everybody's wondering why they don't have it now. And I think we're seeing Miami and Florida State both putting that talent back on the field. So these aren't – when they're at the they're, – they're, you know, Miami's kind of a different ACC team when they get their talent level where it used to be in the old days. Uh, so I think it was a very good team that came in and played. Then two – you know, A&M got ahead and then some some breaks went the other way. Uh, and it was a tight ball game where they were having a chance to win at the very end. Uh, and then I think I, I want to say Miami scored at the end on one big long play to stretch it out, but mm-hmm. but uh, it was a tough loss to a very good team. And uh, and all I can say is there's a lot of talent on Texas A&M field and on Miami's side of the field, uh, and uh, um, and they're going to be mad. And and I, and I play them next, so I'm, that's that's all I can think about. A <laughs> and M's not going to be they're not going to be happy. And uh, uh, but I do see a Miami team that's got been much 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 improved at, athletically. And football wise, and uh, and I see Texas A and M being in the same boat, and so uh, uh, we we I know what kind of athletes they got, and I know how they can play. So we just got we got to play our best and hope we can we can stand up, we can hold up against them a little bit. No doubt, Coach. Thank you so much for for taking a few minutes to join us. Good luck this weekend with with your team, and and really appreciate you taking a few minutes to to join us. Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. Look forward to seeing y'all uh, in College Station. <laughs>